Hello, Thrilling Suspense fanatics, channel listeners, readers, longtime fans, and new ones. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to read The Colossus of Yalorn, which I am surprised to find is not currently on the internet. Because of that, short intro, short outro. Here we go with part one of The Colossus of Yalorn. The Colossus of Yalorn, The Flight of the Necromancer. The thrice infamous Nether, alchemist, astrologer, and necromancer, with his ten devil-given pupils, had departed very suddenly and under circumstances of strict secrecy from the town of Vion. It was widely thought, among the people of that vicinage, that his departure had been prompted by a salutary fear of ecclesiastical thumbscrews and faggots. Other wizards, less notorious than he, had already gone to the stake during a year of unusual inquisitory zeal, and it was well known that Nether had incurred the reprobation of the church. Few, therefore, considered the reason of his going a mystery, but the means of transit which he had employed, as well as the destination of the sorcerer and his pupils, were regarded as more than problematic. A thousand dark and superstitious rumors were abroad, and passers made the sign of the cross when they neared the tall, gloomy house which Nether had built in blasphemous proximity to the great cathedral and had filled with a furniture of satanic luxury and strangeness. Two daring thieves, who had entered the mansion when the fact of its desertion became well established, reported that much of this furniture, as well as the books and other paraphernalia of Nether, had seemingly departed with its owner, doubtless the same fiery born. This served to augment the unholy mystery, for it was patently impossible that Nether and his ten apprentices, with several cartloads of household belongings, could have used the ever-guarded city gates in any legitimate manner without the knowledge of the custodians. It was said by the more devout and religious moiety that the arch-fiend, with a legion of bat-winged assistants, had borne them away bodily at moonless midnight. There were clerics, and also reputable burghers, who professed to have seen the flight of dark man-like shapes upon the blotted stars, together with others that were not men, and to have heard the wailing cries of the hell-hound crew as they passed in an evil cloud over roofs and city walls. Others believed that the sorcerers had transported themselves from Vion through their own diabolic arts, and had withdrawn to some unfrequented fastness where Nether, who had long been in feeble health, could hope to die in such peace and serenity as might be enjoyed by one who stood between the flames of the Auto da Fe and those of Abaddon. It was thought that he had lately cast his own horoscope for the first time in his fifty-odd years, and had read therein an impending conjunction of disastrous planets signifying early death. Others still, among whom were certain rival astrologers and enchanters, said that Nether had retired from the public view merely that he might commune without interruption with various coadjutive demons, and thus might weave unmolested the black spells of a supreme and lycanthropic malice. These spells, they hinted, would in due time be visited upon Vion, and perhaps upon the entire region of Avaroin, and would no doubt take the form of a fearsome pestilence, or a wholesale involtuation, or a realm-wide incursion of succubi and incubi. Amid the seething of strange rumors, many half-forgotten tales were recalled, and new legends were created overnight. Much was made of the obscure nativity of Nether, and his dubitable wanderings before he had settled six years previous in Vion. People said that he was fiend-begotten, like the fabled Merlin, his father being no less a personage than Alastor, demon of revenge, and his mother a deformed and dwarfish sorceress. From the former he had taken his spitefulness and malignity, from the latter his squat, puny physique. He had traveled in Orient lands, and had learned from Egyptian or Saracenic masters the unhallowed art of necromancy, in whose practice he was unrivaled. 
there were black whispers anent to the use he had made of long dead bodies of fleshless bones and the service he had wrung from buried men that the angel of doom alone could lawfully raise up he had never been popular though many had sought his advice and assistance in the furthering of their own more or less dubious affairs once in the third year after his coming to villon he had been stoned in public because of his brooded necromancies and had been permanently lamed by a well-directed cobble this injury it was thought he had never forgiven and he was said to return the antagonism of the clergy with the hellish hatred of an antichrist apart from the sorcerous evils and abuses of which he was commonly suspected he had long been looked upon as a corrupter of youth despite his minican stature his deformity and ugliness he possessed a remarkable power a mesmeric persuasion and his pupils whom he was said to have plunged into bottomless and ghoulish iniquities were young men of the most brilliant promise on the whole his vanishment was regarded as a quite providential riddance among the people of the city there was one man who took no part in the sombre gossip and lurid speculation this man was gaspard du nord himself a student of the proscribed sciences who had been numbered for a year among the pupils of nether but had chosen to withdraw quietly from the master's household after learning the enormities that would attend his further initiation he had, however, taken with him much rare and peculiar knowledge, together with a certain insight into the baleful powers and night-dark motives of the necromancer. Because of this knowledge and insight, Gaspard preferred to remain silent when he heard of Nether's departure. Also, he did not think it well to revive the memory of his own past pupilage. Alone with his books in a sparsely furnished attic, he frowned above a small oblong mirror framed with an arabesque of golden vipers that had once been the property of Nether. It was not the reflection of his own comely and youthful though subtly lined face that caused him to frown. Indeed, the mirror was of another kind than that which reflects the features of the gazer, in its depths for a few instants he had beheld a strange and ominous-looking scene whose participants were known to him but whose location he could not recognize or orientate before he could study it closely the mirror had clouded as if with the rising of alchemic fumes and he had seen no more this clouding he reflected could mean only one thing Nether had known himself watched, and had put forth a counterspell that rendered the clairvoyant mirror useless. It was the realization of this fact, together with the brief, sinister glimpse of Nether's present activities, that troubled Gaspard, and caused a chill horror to mount slowly in his mind, a horror that had not yet found a palpable form or name. End part one. Part two is going to be out tomorrow, so go ahead, like, subscribe, and make sure to check out my web store for Thrilling Suspense Fantasy Volumes 1 and 2, comics and pulps in the classic tradition. Talk to you tomorrow.